You want a weird zebra sex mask? I got a weird zebra sex mask. Welcome to another episode of Business Blaze. I am your host, Simon Whistler, and this script's written by Danny. We're going to be going through today it's the four companies that started out doing something very different. Even the very best of us tend to take a few side steps and stumbles before discovering what it is that we were really born to do. Harrison Ford started out as a carpenter before carving out a career in acting. Barack Obama's first job was selling ice cream. Whoopi Goldberg used to be a morgue beautician. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Is that somebody who makes bodies look nice? Also, I find it generally weird. Like, in Britain, we definitely don't have open casket funerals. And it's something I find very strange that people want to look at their dead relatives. <laughs> like, in an open setting, where they're kind of like, their eyes have been like, whatever Whoopi Goldberg was doing to bodies. I don't want that done to me after I die. Just burn me and put me in the ocean. Actually, don't. I'd like to have my brain frozen. Believe it or not, Christopher Walken used to be a lion tamer in a circus before he shifted over to the slightly safer arena of the movie screen. Wow. Simon Whistler used to be a professional YouTuber before he... Oh, he's still doing that YouTube stuff. Scrap that one, then. Very funny, Danny. Simon Whistler. He's done very weird jobs in his lifetime. I, I remember I did an early video on this channel where I just spent most of it talking about how I used to work in a newsagent. Another thing I did was take experimental drugs for money. That's one we can expand on in the future. But the same principle applies to businesses too. Many of the most famous companies in the world actually started out doing very different things to the stuff we'd recognize today. Let's crack on, Danny. That's enough of an introduction. Number one, Amazon. That iconic Amazon logo features a bendy arrow at the bottom, stretching from the letter as A to Z in the company's name, conveying the message that the website sells pretty much every product from A to Z. So whether you're after an anti-snoring nose clip, handy, or a zebra latex mask, what is that? Any bets on what category this will be in on Amazon? Like, I feel like it could equally be in Halloween costumes or like weird sexual fetishes. <laughs> it's one of these things. I've seen horse versions of this. Tell you what, if this video gets a thousand likes, I'll buy one of these. And we're in a video. Not for the whole video, because then you wouldn't be able to hear me talk. But Halloween's coming up, actually. These are these are a little odd. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that? What is that? <laughs> if that's not in the sex version. Thousand likes, and I'll buy one of those zebra masks. Not the weird one. <laughs> On Amazon, you'll always feel confident that you can find whatever you need. But it didn't start out as a one-stop shop for everything under the sun. In fact, Amazon started out simply selling nothing more than books. <laughs> Danny's like, italicized books, like I'm supposed to emphasize that. Nothing more than books. <laughs> Did anyone not know that Amazon started out selling books? Well, let me know in the comments below. And don't worry, you'll only look like a bit of an idiot. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos launched his first online business in 1994, although he felt that it already left it too late to make money from the dot-com boom and gave himself only a 30% chance of succeeding. Don't like 99% of new businesses fail? Jeff is a bold man. I guess that's why he's by far the richest man in the world. He initially named his business Kadabra, although he later changed his mind when a lawyer misheard it, pronounced in the slightly more sinister Kadava. He later went for Relentless.com, although then he had doubts as this sounded a bit too aggressive. I like Relentless.com. Isn't that... A he probably made money off this anyway because I believe the Coca-Cola company has an energy drink called Relentless, which they probably bought. So he probably sold that domain for an absolute fortune anyway. Oh, he still owns it. It goes to Amazon. Jeff Bezos eventually decided on Amazon because it sounded quite exotic and also because it started with an A, so it would appear near the top of any alphabet alphabetized. Alphabetized? Alphabetized. Those lists where they sort it by the letters. <laughs> Indeed, this is why Acme was a popular company name for a while, because AC would appear near the front of the yellow pages. Interestingly though, over 25 years on, Bezos still owns the domain name for Relentless.com, and it just has it redirecting back to the main Amazon website. I could save myself some time if I actually read these ahead of time. <laughs> Maybe he plans to do something interesting with it one day. I'd sell it to Coke. I'd sell it to Coke, because I'm not the richest man in the world, and I could sell like Relentless.com, and then I would probably never have to work again. <laughs> so, he had a business name, but what was he going to sell? For the richest man in the well, like deciding on the name first is a bit weird. He wasn't sure, he wasn't quite sure himself at first. He narrowed it down to five potential products computer hardware, software, CDs, videos, or books. Figuring that books had a low unit price and a large global demand, he settled on becoming a dedicated online bookseller and launched the operation in the modest surroundings of his garage in a rented property in Washington. The business rapidly took off around the world, largely because other major bookstores like Barnes and Noble were slow off the mark in developing their own online presence. To their enormous 
enormous regret later on. In fact, Barnes & Noble took Amazon to court in 1997, arguing that Amazon's new marketing claim of being the world's largest bookstore was entirely false. Mysteriously, the claim was settled out of court, and Amazon continued to use the same marketing claim. I can just imagine, like, Jeff Bezos in court over this, and he was like, fine, then I'll become the largest store in the world. And then, you know, laughed maniacally like Lex Luthor or something. <laughs> Amazon's massive success with books eventually led to a decision to expand the range of products available on the site, although they didn't go from selling books to selling everything overnight. In 1998, they cautiously experimented with the idea of selling music CDs and videos, while the following year saw Amazon expanding into consumer electronics and toys. This makes sense. It'd be a bit weird if suddenly it was like, what do you sell, Jeff? I sell books. After the weekend. What do you sell, Jeff? Literally everything. You want a book? I got a book. You want a weird zebra sex mask? I got a weird zebra sex mask. Oh, by the year 2000, the famous Curvy Arrow logo was unveiled for the first time, indicating that Amazon now really did sell anything and everything. You can even buy or rent Simon Whistler videos on the platform. You can, but don't. You can get them for free on YouTube. We just put them on there because people do buy stuff on Amazon. It's like we've got our videos on there. People buy them. I don't know why. It was this gradual, slow expansion that played a big part in saving Amazon from going under during the burst of the dot-com bubble when hundreds of other online retailers began to fall off the radar. But it's odd to think that the world's largest e-commerce marketplace and largest internet company by revenue started out selling a few cheap paperbacks in a garage. Number two, Nintendo. The word Nintendo might conjure up a number of different mental images. For most people, it will bring up the face of a certain plumber with a dodgy mustache. For older people, like myself, speak for yourself, Danny. I don't know how old you are. But I'm a young whippersnapper of 32. Found out the other day, technically, I'm a millennial. <laughs> millennials, I'm like well into millennials. Millennials apparently begin like in 1981 or something. Uh, for old people like myself, it brings back memories of playing the original Donkey Kong machine back in the smoky arca arcade halls of the early 1980s. So Danny is a little bit older than me then. The slightly more modern generation may remember accidentally throwing a plastic tennis racket into their television screens while playing Wii Tennis. Now that I do remember. But whatever your age, you're certainly bound to think of electronic video games on some level. But that's not how Nintendo got started. Which is maybe not that surprising, seeing as the company was actually launched back in 1889, just a little while before electronic video Video games started to catch on. Danny, if that's a little while before electronic video games started to catch on, I didn't want to, like, the 15th century, a long time before video games started to catch on. This company started off producing beautiful illustrated playing cards, so it's fair to say that games were always at the heart of Nintendo's business. However, these were more analog than digital. Again, I would say. <laughs> entirely analog. <laughs> they were dedicated to selling playing cards for 70 years before deciding to expand their business and take some very unusual turns in the 1960s. During this period, they set up a taxi service called Daya, which was initially quite successful for a few years before closing down after difficulties with labor unions made the service too expensive to run. God damn it, the unions destroy my business. Fair wages for all? It's ridiculous. Perhaps most bizarrely of all, they briefly launched a small chain of Nintendo love hotels in the 1960s. What's a love hotel? Am I really, like, naive? Is a love hotel like an hourly hotel? According to Wikipedia, a love hotel is a type of short-stay hotel, yeah, it's an hourly hotel, found around the world that's operated primarily for the purpose of allowing guests privacy for sexual activities. The name of... <laughs> There's a link to sexual activities. Human sexual activity. I'm gonna stop there before this video gets demonetized. <laughs> I once stayed in one of these. I was on a road trip in Mexico, and it got really late, and I needed somewhere to stay. So I pulled off the, like, the highway into this hotel, and there was no one there, it was really empty. And I'm like, hey, can I have a room? And they're like, sure, you can have a room. And then I go in, and it's like there's mirrors everywhere, the bed has like a plastic sheet underneath it, there's not really any, any efforts put into like people who would actually be staying there overnight. It was a terrible experience, but it was very cheap. Oh, and there was a mirror on the ceiling above the bed. Weird. Nintendo has always enjoyed a reputation as a wholesome, family-friendly company, so this sidestep into sauciness is something that they'd probably rather we all forget. Too bad, Nintendo. You had sex hotels and I won't forget it. Sex hotels were doing a big business in the swinging 60s, and Nintendo seemed surprisingly keen to get in on the act. 
action. The general idea was the Novorills hotels were very cheap to rent, an ideal proposition for a loved up couple who just wanted to get a room. I'd like to think that these rooms may have been witness to some of Nintendo's future marketing slogans such as, now you're playing with power, superpower, for the SNES or N64's get in or get out. Nintendo were actually facing a huge financial crisis during this period as their share price plummeted to its lowest ever level and the future of the company was looking bleak for a while. However, they eventually got on the right track again with the development of increasingly sophisticated games and toys in the 1970s, leading up to the development of their very first arcade game in 1975. Actually, the very first few arcade games were a bit rubbish and mainly rip-offs of existing titles. But the release of Donkey Kong in 1981 and the introduction of, then un of a then-unnamed hero plumber changed the future of the company forever, paving the way for decades of screaming and swearing at your television screen while playing Mario Kart. Goddamn, Mario Kart is a great game. Uh, number three, moving on, Samsung. Samsung is another company with surprising roots. I feel they did fish. I think Samsung started off selling fish. Let's see if I'm correct. In fact, Samsung has very long and very stringy roots. The electronics giant may be better known for their mobile phones and televisions today, but this is only a relatively recent development for a company that has a long history stretching back to 1938. Although the company's founder, Lee Byung-chul, <laughs> maybe, was one of considered one of South Korea's most successful businessmen ever, it's still sad to note that his death in 1987 meant that he never quite got to see the thriving business that the global corporate entity is today. Well, of course, at some point you're going to die and your company's going to live on after you, that's why you have a company. But he still achieved more than most in his lifetime. Samsung actually started out as a small grocery store in Korea, selling noodles and dried fish. Oh, I knew there was fish. It was a grocery store. So how do you go from selling noodles to producing electronic devices? Well, as you might expect, you go about it in the most long-winded and spun-out way possible. Following the Korean War in the 1950s, Samsung expanded into the textiles industry, opening the largest wool mill in Korea. Later on, they would invest in shipbuilding, food processing, insurance, and the petrochemical industries. It wasn't until 1969 that Samsung dipped its toe into the electronics industry for the first time with a range of black and white television sets. And it wasn't until the 2000s that Samsung finally evolved into a global major player with the release of their first mobile phones, which rapidly topped annual best-selling phone lists around the world. There you go. Start off selling fish, and now you're a corporate giant. Number four, Nokia. Nokia? Nokia. Who says Nokia? Is that Americans? Nokia. Nokia. That would have been bad news for one of their major competitors of the time, Nokia. The now, fam now famous for introducing the mildly annoying Nokia ringtone into the background of our everyday lives for years, Nokia actually has an impressive history going all the way back to 1865, where, no, I remember this, is this the do 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 I didn't, I definitely didn't have a piano play in it. Yeah! What the f is th Someone made a dubstep Nokia ringtone? I, I despise dubstep. It barely qualifies as music. Hit that dislike button if you love dubstep. Back then, they were more interested in paper than digital devices. Nokia opens up a couple of prosperous wood pulp mills in the 19th century, which manufactured paper before making the brave leap into rubber and cabling at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century. Extremely brave. They began to dabble in electronics in the 1960s, about 50 years after the death of the original Nokia founder, Frederick Eidstam. I thought Nokia was like... Asian. <laughs> but Frederick Eidstam is... Wait, did we say where it was from? He sounds ger- the dice guy sounds German, but I thought Nokia was like... More about Nokia. It's from Finland. Or its headquarters are in Finland. I'm gonna assume it's from Finland, because they probably did <laughs> They probably didn't establish themselves in Seoul, and then were like, where should we set up our corporate headquarters? Hmm, how about Finland? It wasn't until 1992 that they decided to dedicate their entire business operation to mobile phones and network infrastructure, finally hanging up on paper, rubber, and cables forever. Oh, very funny, hanging up. 1992, wow. I'd like to buy some old Nokia paper. Nokia's fortunes in the mobile industry may have dwindled since their heyday in the 90s and 2000s, but look at it this way. In a company history spanning over 150 years, they've only spent a relatively tiny fraction of that time producing products which we now closely associate with the brand. It could just be the case that they haven't quite found their niche yet. This has been four companies that started li their lives as something else. If you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up button. If you love dubstep, hit that dislike button. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, all of that good stuff. Uh, this channel has videos three times a week currently. Yes, I think that's all my plugs. I'll see you next time.